the way of talking about this home style program so that I can actually help you you know, kind of get a good sense or well, a good sense of what it is that we do here at Rimmon Wholesale with our program overall. Now where I like to begin, where I like to start, even you know the greatest of journeys, you have to you know begin it with a simple step. That simple step, you know, that first one is going to be to tell you, you know, a little bit about who we are for those of you that may not be familiar. Uh, Rimmon Wholesale, our entire identity is predicated on the idea of service. In fact, our senior management is comprised of people that have, you know, 30 years of actual, you know, real mortgage experience. We're not talking about just a group of MBAs. We are literally talking about, you know, um, you know, a mortgage company that was made by mortgage people for mortgage people. So, with saying that, we give you an unprecedented level of flexibility and transparency with how we operate, and this translates exactly into our renovation lending, which is why we've been able to grow in the rental landscape in such a quick, you know, amount of time. A few years back, Remen completely stopped doing renovation loans, and for a number of years, it was completely inactive. You know, not doing it at all, and only you know two and a half years ago did the company get back into it. In that time frame, that we have become active in the renovation lending landscape, we have quickly risen to being the number three volume renovation lender in the entire country, which is a pretty lofty accomplishment. Something that we're very much proud of. However, it's still not something that we consider to be a destination. You know, being in the top five is great. But no one wants to be among the class. You know, the dream is to be the head of the class, which is what leads us to situations like today. We know that the only way we're ever going to get to be number one is if we're able to help make sure that our clientele, which is you, you know, the originators out there, that you feel comfortable with this program, that you're actually able to use them, and that you realize all the different resources that we make available to you so that you can get into this type of lending and capitalizing on market trends and really augmenting your business and overall, you know, your ability to, you know, stay in the black and to keep everything moving. So we're talking about the opportunity that exists. It's only pertinent that we really discuss, you know, the opportunity with a little bit more detail. Now, overall, I imagine that everyone that's here on this call, you all, you know, were able to read something that brought you here. So when you say, you know, homestyle renovations, you know that we're talking about, you know, a mortgage program where we're going to have some kind of renovation aspect. Somehow we're going to renovate a home using a mortgage. So I know that all of you kind of get that basic premise. But to go beyond that basic premise, really gets us to a place where we're talking about, you know, the opportunity that having such a program affords to us all. The bottom line here, if anybody's ever spent, you know, a second watching any renovation-centric show on certain cable networks, you know, you know, quite frankly, there's a great divide between, you know, what the average home buyer can actually afford and then the home that they actually ideally see themselves, you know, living in and occupying forever. You know, that concept of the forever, you know, the perfect home. Typically, home buyers have to make several concessions, you know, regarding you know, what they want to have in that perfect home, whether it be, you know, the number one beacon, which is, you know, having a home in the location that they most desire, or it's going to be in, you know, the actual physical presence of the home itself, whether it's going to be the exterior curb repeal, you know, um, whether or not the kitchen, you know, and bathrooms have been updated, you know, and are in vogue with, you know, trends this century, you know, or overall size or any other, you know, a number of deficiencies that can possibly exist inside of, you know, uh, any particular home. You know, in the past, the mortgage business had the reputation for just letting borrowers unrealistically buy as much house as they thought that they wanted without having any care for what they could, you know, really hold on to and what they could afford. Those days, you know, are over. You know, we have, you know, seen the fallout from what can happen with that. So now everyone's sobered up and people are, you know, really realizing you have to buy a home that's within your means financially. With renovation lending, we can, you know, take that sobering viewpoint and we can say, Yes, you do have to live within your means. You do have to, you know, you know, take on a housing payment that is in with the realistic possibility that you can actually, you know, go through the terms of making this repayment happen. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have 
more of the things that you want in your home. Renovation lending lets us take the borrower's actual purchasing power and it stretches that to you know the ability to buy more house for that same money. Because the bottom line is by making renovations, they can get some of those turnkey modern features and amenities in homes that are on the market in those perfect locations at a discounted price. So overall, renovation lending really is the opportunity to help you know uh, our business partners in terms of talking about realtors and helping homeowners really afford the most home that they possibly can while still maintaining a budget you know that won't leave them either a house poor or b you know completely unable to realistically hold on you know to the property at all and this is going to include you know homeowners as well as prospective home buyers now we're talking about the ability to take a homeowner that has an expanding family that already has a home in the perfect location they don't have to worry about moving now they're going to have the ability to actually look at the you know the prospect of renovating their current home to meet you know their new needs whether it's you know something that you know a scary instance where suddenly now someone has a disability and you have to retrofit your home to make it safe and accessible you know for that particular person if you're talking about adding on a new bedroom to make you know room for a growing family or even something as simple you know with the home style is just talking about you know the idea of you know having that you know that that list of things that you would like to make the home perfect whether it be a new kitchen a new bathroom adding on an ensuite to a master bedroom creating a second level you know um, taking care of issues with the you know with, with maintenance on the exterior of the property new siding you know you know painting for the home style being able to work with you know landscaping on the outside of your property so just basically you know um Making a new layout for your you know, for your driveway, you know, taking care of sodding you know issues if you have you know you know a poor problem with your lawn, adding that pool that you've been talking about for years. Instead of having to move to make an effective change to get these things, you're going to give you know a family the ability to procure these amenities inside of their home far more reasonably than they have ever been able to do so before. Because the bottom line, whether you're talking about creating value in a property that you're purchasing or creating that level of comfort you know, in the home that you already have, there is no way that is cheaper to obtain financing to make a renovation happen than with a renovation mortgage. I mean, just simply put, it, it really cannot be done. Now, with this ability, what you wind up doing for yourself is really rewriting the rules of your relationships and the dynamics that you have with realtors. With the home style in particular, you're going to get an ability to actually create new referral bases from other service providers that you previously did not have. And this is tremendous. Number one, when you're talking about augmenting your realtor relationships, you're going to be, you're going to be able to now become a resource that will allow a realtor to close on more homes because guess face it every realtor has a book of dirty dogs these you know properties that are definitely outside of the norm for what the market expects that are either too small or lacking in one area or another that they show but they can never get anyone to pull the trigger and put ink on paper for a contract you're going to be their specialist at moving those homes to take a no money a no win situation and turn it into some kind of financial gain by becoming that person you're going to you know really rearrange that realtor relationship now you're going to be able to dictate more of those terms and make sure that you're not only getting that business but getting as much business as you can from these realtors because you're going to be you know their savior you know on the tough properties so that's going to give you nothing but a right to ask for more of the business on those layup properties as well. Outside of talking about those realtors, let's talk about other individual service providers. Let's talk about, you know, pool installation guys or contractors that have, have homeowners that have taken on projects that either they've discovered, you know, some kind of unforeseen problem and now they don't have the financial backing to finish the property and take care, you know, of the issues they've discovered or, you know, a, a homeowner that wanted to do a project but just didn't have a, a good grasp on the actual cost of what that project would be and then kind of never got past the initial bid you're going to be able to work with these contractors that had these either stalled or failed to get off the ground projects 
you're going to be able to come in and help them obtain financing to make these things actually happen. The great thing is with the Homestyle as a program, it actually has the ability to take a stalled renovation, you know, a, you know, work that is, you know, you know, mid hammer swing, and if the borrowers run out of money, we'll be actually be able to help them finish. So those, you know, uh, third party service providers, those contractors, and those pool people, and those HVAC specialists, those roofing guys, suddenly now they all have to be the ability to become referrals which is a pretty powerful thing, something that everybody should consider. Now, inside of the home style itself, let us talk about the basic definition of what this mortgage program is. This is a Fannie Mae conventional fixed mortgage like any other. The major difference is it also is going to include the ability to escrow money to make renovations on the property. This renovation escrow that we're going to establish is the only major significant difference between a home style loan and any other Fannie Mae conventional fixed mortgage. There is only one close. The borrower does not have to convert it or, or anything. It's going to be set up and it's going to follow the amortization schedule exactly as any other Fannie Mae mortgage would from the day that it actually closes. So the borrower doesn't have to worry about paying for a second closing, qualifying at a later date, or anything like that. It's all going to happen in one concentric close. So it is very much you know, an effective use of making time. Now, for those of you that are wondering, hey, or this home style, conventional, you know, a conventional renovation program, how does it compare to what I already know with the FHA 203K? That is an excellent question. And if you take a look at the slide that I have prepared here, what I want you to really notice is that these two programs, while they do overlap because both are able to work on you know, uh, owner-occupied properties between one and four units, while that is absolutely the case, they are made actually to complement each other in an odd way because they cover you know uh, some some different fringes from each other, and it kind of helps balance out the overall renovation landscape. If you're looking at doing something with the uh, home style renovation, the major differences that I want you to consider, you know, um, are going to be we don't have to worry about the limitation that FHA has on luxury items. So if your borrower wants to put in a pool or a spa. You know, or just go nuts with the exterior landscaping of the property, they can do that with the home style without abandon because the bottom line here, for the home style, we're going to moor our expectations down to what we can and cannot do with the program based on a couple of simple rules, the second of which is going to be based on value. So since this program is more predicated on value, there is less of an instance where Fannie Mae is going to look to try to limit high-end fix. Fannie Mae is going to like high-end fixes. High-end fixes, one of their high return on, you know, return on investment items, definitely are going to allow us to move the needle higher on valuation. You know, so you know those luxury items, exterior kitchens, and things like that, they're a big area where we're going to be able to make a difference. But inside of a home, you're going to find that everything is virtually identical, except for a small, you know, number of rules. Outside of the actual what's possible with renovations, the things to consider with the home style that are definite differences, we're going to open up to different types of home ownership. Second homes and investors are going to be welcome markets with the home style. All right, now depending upon where you are geographically in the country, there could be literally legion, like a large number of vacation properties sitting there that have been idle and not updated for 20 years because borrowers just are not able to procure financing to actually make a difference on updating those homes, and they would love to. This is going to give them the ability to borrow that money in a discreet, well, not a discreet, but in a cost-effective manner, so that they will be able to actually make those renovations to make their secondary residence just as comfortable as their primary residence. For the investor market, we're talking about a very powerful tool that is going to allow them to do, you know, a um, a big turnover in terms of how they operate because with the home style, they're going to be able to borrow. You know, up to you know on a purchase transaction, 80% of the overall money that it will take to not only purchase the property but also affect the renovation. Which means that by a simple measure, they're going to be able to lower their financial risk. They're going to now not have to show or not put as much of their own you know hard-earned capital into making the renovation on any particular home. The effect that that has, quite simply is twofold. On one track, when you think about it, you know, lower risk means, you know, literally 
having to put in less money. By putting in less money, you know, for the renovations, that's going to automatically give, you know, an ability now to instead of scaling back the renovations that you're going to put into a property so that you don't run the risk of now not, not of not being able to turn a profit, they're going to be able to make sure that they can take the property to an appropriate level to be a premium listing in that particular area, whether it's going to be for further, you know, for pending resale down the road or whether that's going to be, you know, as a rental property to hold on. But being able to charge premium rent because it's a top of the market listing is definitely going to be something that is, you know, highly beneficial. The other end of this is simply put, on a renovation loan, we're making our lending proposition on value based off of the after improvement value of the property, which means prior to putting up a single penny, once they have the appraisal, they are going to know the future value of the property. For most investors, they have, you know, they are basically making educated guesses on what the value, what they're going to be able to resell this property for, or what they're going to be able to charge for rent. Inside of a renovation loan, inside of a home style, they're going to actually have an appraisal that's going to outline both of those factors for them. So this significantly reduces the level of risk that they have in making decisions upon how they are going to renovate and, uh, and elevate these properties in the future. So now, let's take a look at what we can actually do. I, I know I've alluded to this in the last couple of slides, but let's take a nice hard look at it. We have a slide here that is showing a large amount of possible work that we can do with the Homestar Renovation Loan. I want you to realize that this list is not all-inclusive, as extensive as it is, but let's take a look. There are, you know, everything that I could literally think of in between minor cosmetic fixes all the way up to major, you know, uh, mechanical system replacement, structural additions, you know, um, and everything that runs the range in between, you know, runs the range in between, listed here on this particular slide. But even though we have this great, uh, you know, base work to talk about, the reason why I can't say that it's all inclusive is simply because of this. The home style, eligible, the eligible repair list is you know, literally listed as Fannie Mae as any renovation that is permanently affixed to the subject property that will also add sufficient value to the property. So any value adding permanently affixed renovation is going to be, you know, really considered an eligible repair. Now, I imagine that, you know, most of you that have never heard this rule before are probably wondering what exactly does permanently affixed mean and how does that shake into the proceedings? Well, let's talk about the definition, but we're going to speak about it in parables, and let's talk about the parable of the kitchen refinance. I'm sorry, the kitchen remodel. In any kitchen remodel, you're going to have the opportunity to replace or upgrade the existing appliances. Here's what I want you to realize about appliances. Most consumer available, you know, uh, freestanding appliances are not considered permanently affixed because they are easily removed from the property. So that's going to cover, you know, your standard refrigerator and your standard, you know, uh, you know, range. You know, your, you know, your uh, cooktop with, not a cooktop, but your standard range with a. Uh, whether it's electric or gas with an oven, those freestanding appliances can be easily removed from the property. They're not considered permanently affixed. However, with the home style, here's what I want you to realize. While you can't pay for a you know, consumer grade refrigerator, microwave, or you know, a range with your home style funds, if you take that next step up and think a little bit more high end, all of a sudden you see that these things would be possible if you were to go for a sub-zero refrigerator that's you know installed and blended into your cabinetry. That's considered permanently affixed and is eligible for home style funding. If you were to look at a wall oven and a cooktop that's been that's been sunk into the countertop, again now you're talking about items that are permanently affixed and you can use them. In terms of a microwave, if they use a microwave range hood, that's permanently affixed to a wall, not easily removed to a property you know, from the property, and again is eligible to be installed, you know, with home style funds. So that's the way you need to think. As long as it's something that is permanently a part of the property, it can absolutely be paid for and installed with your home style. So to talk about things that we can't do, we've already spoken about permanently affixed. 
let's talk about the few remaining stipulations, the things that we have to really worry about. From a matter of fact kind of perspective, since this is such a value driven program, renovations that do not add sufficient value to the property, you know, quote unquote, the ability to over improve for the market, you're going to see that just based on the reality of how the loan is structured, that those, renovate, those types of renovations will not make sense. Also, anything that's for a commercial use, so if your borrower's dream is to turn their property's living room into a waiting or reception area for their, you know, for their home business, unfortunately, no, we're not going to be able to make those renovations with the program. And then also, the construction of accessory units. So this is going to mean, you know, uh, creating a detached pool house or a, or a new detached garage or anything of that nature. These things we will not be able to actually accommodate with the home style in and of itself. Now, once we actually have an eligible renovation plan, there are two different ways that we can carry out the actual administration of the home style. One of which is without the use of an approved HUD consultant, and then the other is with the use of an approved HUD consultant. Now, for any of you that are familiar with the 203Ks, you realize, oh, this kind of mirrors what happens with Streamline and full 203Ks. But there are some important differences to consider when we're talking about you know, how one or the other is done in a home style loan versus the 203Ks. Now, what is the same, we do have two lines in the sand, basically you know, uh, two different ways to determine whether the loan has to be one or the other you know, in terms of being a with or without consultant loan. The first is going to be financial, but the financial line in the sand is different with the home style than it is with the 203K. On a home style, that line in the sand is actually set at $15,000. So if your total repair escrow is at or above $15,000, we're automatically going to, you know, going to require you to use a certified HUD consultant. The next step is going to be scope of work, and this is basically the same rule as, as what we have with the 203K. If you have any major repairs, and major is going to be defined as anything that is structural related to working on the foundation of the property or a major landscaping you know, uh, you know, project such as you know, um, the repair of a retaining wall or, or you know, working on you know, or making you know, major repairs to a pool or the installation of a pool. And last but not least, certainly any renovation plan that requires the use or is using structure, you know, any, any exhibits or reports from engineers or an architect. All right, so if we have any of those situations happening within the home, we will automatically require it to be a with a consultant loan versus you know, being a non-consultant loan. Now, the great thing, when you're using a consultant, everything that is considered an eligible repair is on the table. You can do literally anything that you could possibly imagine as long as we can deem it an eligible repair. And then obviously a loan without a consultant is for smaller renovations that do not you know, stretch the budget or make a major impact on the property whatsoever. Now a major departure that is very much different with the home style that I want to make sure that everyone is aware of, when we do a home style loan without a consultant, there is only one draw. So that one draw happens after the work is completed. So we, so the contractor, whenever we're using a, a home style without a consultant, does not receive any money until the renovation work is completed and we have a final inspection made by the appraiser. So I want everyone to realize that because it's a pretty major difference. If your contractor doesn't have the, you know, the comfort level to front out the money for an entire job, you're certainly going to want to make sure that you go with a consultant in those particular cases as well. Now whether or not you're doing a with consultant or without consultant loan, what I want you to realize is the program does not operate any differently from an origination standpoint. All of your documentation, you know, uh, for our, to cover our basic credit qualifying requirements, you know, uh, age documentation, and the appraisal, all of that really remains exactly the same. So there are, is no difference in the origination of such a file. It really is going to come down to how everything is actually, um, you know, uh, structured for the administration of the construction project once the renovations actually begin. Now, overall for eligibility, let us you know go through this quickly and talk about you know our maximum LTVs. If we're talking about a you know an owner-occupied property, 
a one unit property can get maximum financing up to 95% LTV. This drops down to 85% when we're speaking about a two unit property and down to 75% once we go to three or four units. For a vacation home, or, you know, or what we call a second home, we can do maximum financing at 90%. Now, for those two, we're talking about the you know, same maximum LTV, whether we're talking about a purchase transaction or a limited cash out refinance. The only time that becomes a different LTV is for investment properties. On investment, our maximum you know, LTV for a single family investment property on a purchase transaction is going to be 80%. This is lowered to 75% when we're talking about a refinance. I did point out single family investment. So we only do single family investment properties. We do not do two units. And now let us you know, get into talking about this a little bit further. First thing I want you to realize, whenever we say limited cash out refinance on a renovation loan, that actually means zero cash back to borrower. There's no incidental cash back to the borrower at the closing table, nor are any proceeds left in escrow returned to the borrower as cash in hand you know, at the completion of the project. In either case, if we would have that incidental cash back or if we would have any money is left over, once the project is completed, they are applied to the borrower's mortgage as a principal reduction. Okay, so I want everybody to realize that. Also, let us talk about some uh, some other ideas. It is possible with the home style to not require MI if your borrower can put up, uh, you know, finance less than 80%. You know, as you would with any other conventional mortgage. However, if you do finance more than 80%, and we do have required MI. You know, our MI provider could have additional, you know, guidelines for us to follow. Those things will become applicable. Also, manual underwriting is not permitted in our home style program. Your loans will have to run through to you with an approved eligible rating in order to be, you know, uh, you know, in order to be worked with. We do offer high balance for the home style. High balance, you know, high balance transactions are absolutely possible. What I want you to realize, though, is that High Balance has a separate eligibility chart. So, if you do not have, you know, quick access, you know, to seeing, you know, uh, High Balance LTVs, surely let me know, and I'll make sure that I can point you in the right direction. In fact, we do actually have, you know, the High Balance LTVs published inside of our Home Style Guides. Now, overall, in property eligibility. Let us discuss some of the things that we're able to do. We've already spoken about, you know, you know, the good old-fashioned basics. So you know that we can do a one through four unit owner-occupied property. But let's take that a little bit further. Let's talk about, you know, all of those planned urban developments. We can certainly work with PUDs, you know, for all of our, you know, for all of our suburban sprawls out there. And anything that's an established warrantable condo, we can certainly work with. There's one caveat. The condo project itself must have more than five units in the entire project. So please you know, be aware and cognizant of that. Things that will automatically make your property ineligible, the first, the number one thing with the bullet, not having a valid certificate of occupancy. Each project that we work on must have a habitable you know, property. So the CO cannot have been, you know, invalidated for any reason. This is going to include, you know, the property being condemned or in situations where we have new construction where the property was never completed. Right? If we have either of those circumstances, unfortunately the problem the pro the pro sorry, the property will be ineligible and we will not be able to work with said property. The great news is though, unlike the 203K, we don't need that CO to be valid for more than 12 months. All right? the, the CO could have been valid for the previous two weeks, and we can work with it. So when it was completed is not an issue for us, as long as it actually has the valid CO, is going to be good enough. Property types that just make us feel a little bit uncomfortable and that we cannot work with them, co-ops, modular, and manufactured homes. We're not be able to do anything with those. And then we have the, of course, types of properties. So those are going to be condo hotels, unique properties such as, you know, churches and lighthouses. Absolutely not. Working fam, I'm sorry, working farms or ranches. So if a farmer wants to buy a farmhouse and farm on the land, we will not give him a home style loan to work on. However, if a civilian wants to buy a farmhouse just to live in it, 
that is something that is absolutely possible, provided the property does not have any commercial aspects or features. Any commercial property is not going to be eligible for our Homestyle program for any particular reason. So overall, we've talked about the absolute uh, you know, uh, things that we can do in terms of overall eligibility inside of the property. At this point, let's turn our attention to how we really tackle the idea of getting everything together to make the loan actually work. Now, granted, many of you probably you know have had you know uh, horror stories that you've either experienced in the past or have heard about in regards to renovation lending because there are so many extra pieces and things are so uncomfortable and unfamiliar. What I'm here to tell you is that this process can literally be as easy as you allow it to be. One of the things I told you right back in the beginning when we talked about the definition of the program was what we consider this loan to be. The first thing that we consider with this program is that it is simply put a Fannie Mae conventional 30-year fixed mortgage first and foremost. We don't take the step of making this out to be some kind of new or exotic program. This is something that we really feel is generally a lot more of the same. There are just some certain aspects that you need to learn how to control. And that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about those, you know, those those few pieces in the loan that you don't typically have to deal with, you know, on a standard, you know, Fannie Mae conventional fixed mortgage. These two additional pieces you have to manage really are the contractor, who's the most necessary of all necessary evils, and then the HUD-approved consultant, which honestly. And renovation lending is a blessing because it's that one force that kind of helps to keep everybody honest. But overall, the hierarchy of the loan remains exactly the same. Every all, all of us, we work with the borrower. The next in line to really consider is the lender. You know, us, Rim and Wholesale. We're going to be the ones actually providing the borrower with you know the program, and we're going to give them some expertise to lend you know to lean on, so that this way they don't have to worry about becoming construction experts in and of themselves. In fact, any of you that may have the idea that the borrower is going to have to you know suddenly become an expert in the art of construction, hiring contractors, and dealing you know with everything that that's involved with that process, you're taking the wrong path. The borrower is absolutely paying a premium to work with a renovation program. So what we need to do is wrap them in a value so that they feel validated in making that decision so that they can get to that point where they want to be, where they can get to having this dream home without feeling like the road was fraught with frustrations and um, you know, in, in different aspects they didn't understand you know, the entire duration you know, of the ride. We want them to get there as easily as possible. We want to take on you know, everything that there is to take on you know, in that. And us being the lender, we don't want you as the originator to really be stuck and encumbered with having to provide the bar with that kind of experience. We want you to lean on our experience as well. The next level down from dealing with the lenders are going to be our individual service providers. Now, all of you are familiar with dealing with appraisers. You know, uh, you know, this is fairly accurate. There have been appraisals as long as there have been mortgages, just about. But you need to make sure that you're aware of how the appraisal impacts a renovation loan, especially a home style, since there's such a huge, you know, um, importance placed on the actual value listed on the appraisal. You know, the contractor and the consultant. They each are necessary evils that we have to have a part of this program. But if you learn the rules of engagement and how their documentation falls into the loan program, you will see that this is not as scary as you may have imagined. Now, with talking about all these different pieces and whether they all kind of fit in, I bet you wonder, well, why haven't you represented us as the originator on the slide? I'm going to tell you, relax. I have represented you. You are the lifeblood that holds everything together. So that line that touches every single piece and item on this page, that's what you are. So simply put, you are the person that's going to touch everything and relay all the information back to the borrower. And we want to make sure that you understand the information and the pieces that they've come from so that you can relay that information back to your borrower and maintain the image of being a knowledgeable professional and help sure you know help make sure that they feel safe with the scenario. So first, let's talk about our appraisal. There are some basic precepts in our appraisal that you just have to understand. The first of them is that the appraisal on a home style is never done on an as-is basis. You will never find an as-is value listed inside of your home style appraisal. The thing that we care most about is going to be your as-is value. So the value in the appraisal on a home style loan is listed as subject to. 
So in order for the appraisal to come, I'm sorry, in order for the appraiser to come up with a subject to value, they need to know the entire renovation plan and exactly what's going to be done to the property so they can actually make a value proposition based on all of its, you know, added on, you know, features and amenities. So you need to have, you know, your contractor's bid or if you're doing a consultant loan, your consultant's report available to the contractor when you order the appraisal. So for any time that you're ordering an appraisal on a home style loan, you want to have you know, either of those two documents available first, so that this way they can be incorporated into the appraisal, and they absolutely will be. That bid or that bid or consultant's report will be included in the body of the appraisal, you know, itself. So it's important that you absolutely have it with you, you know, at all times. Now, depending upon whether or not we were working on a purchase or refinance transaction, things do work slightly differently. On a purchase our actual predominant value for the overall transaction is going to be the lesser of the two between our after improvement value, so that future value of the property, or the total cost of acquisition on the property, which is going to be the cost to purchase and then renovate the property. All right, so we're going to take that combined cost and we're going to compare that to its future value. Whichever of those two values lower is going to be the value that we use on the actual purchase transaction itself. All right. Um, on a refinance, the only thing that we look at is the after improvement value. We do not go any further than that on a refinance. We do not, uh, you know, uh, care to know what the property's current value is. Now, either way, the after improvement value is going to be a major determining factor, you know, inside of this loan because the amount of money that we can set aside for renovations. So. The total value of our repair escrow is going to be limited by our appraisal value. All right, so the theoretical cap on any loan that we can hold for renovations is going to be equal to 50% of the after improvement value listed on the appraisal. You know, so again, making sure that you're steering the borrowers to you know toward making you know uh, value adding renovations to the property is going to be important because of this limitation. And what can be, you know, in, in terms of what our, our overall budget can be to renovate the property. Now, for those of you that are, you know, um, working in conventional land here, you know that we can't actually, you know, let you use any AMC of your choice. We have to funnel you toward one MMC. I'm sorry, one AMC to use. In this particular case, for us, it is MMC. Even if you are working in an area where MMC is not licensed, there is a process to follow in order for you, you know, to find the proper AMC, you know, to work with, speak with your account executive, they're going to be able to get you pointed in the right direction. Moving on to the contractor. It is important that you understand how to work with contractors because there is no way to avoid using them in the home style, but this relationship is not something that is very difficult to understand. In fact, it is a much more simple than most of you, you know, have ever you know thought it could possibly be, but we're going to take some time to completely define that relationship between you know um, you know Remen Wholesale, the contractor, and the borrower, so that you're going to understand what you're walking into. The first thing that you must know: the use of a contractor is mandatory. There is zero self-help allowed in the home style. All right, and when we say self-help, that's going to extend down. To borrowers that own contracting companies, their contracting company is also not going to be allowed to be, the, you know, the contractor of record on their home style loan. The borrowers to have zero influence over their renovations happening to the property whatsoever. All right, familiar relationships on the home style are okay. So their cousin, their brother-in-law, their father can be the contractor. However, there are some limitations to that particular relationship. The borrower is not allowed to work for, you know, the contractor. And the borrower cannot have any ownership interest in that contracting business, nor can the owner of the contracting business have any ownership interest in the borrower's property at all. All right, but outside of that, familial relationships between the contractor and borrower are okay. Now, the model that we use for work inside of our home start program is fairly simple. We use one general contractor to be our, you know, our general contractor. It's going to be in charge of the entire job. Now this GC is going to have to give us a bid that's going to encompass all work being done to the property. This would include any work that's being done by sub or specialty contractors. 
the GC will be allowed to use as many sub or specialty contractors that they, you know, that they see fit. However, Rem and Wholesale will have no direct relationship with these subcontractors. We will only deal with the general contractor directly, which is going to include the remittance of funds. We'll only make payment directly to the GC. We will then have to subsequently give payment to the sub or specialty contractors. This allows us to not have to fill out duplicate forms while the loan is in process. So you don't have to worry about you know, getting licensing and other information together or filling out the contractor forms for several contractors. Using this model, we only have to do it once. It's going to make your life much more simple in terms of being able to originate these loans and get through the process. Aside from that, there's just one other thing that we need to understand, and that's going to be you know, state mandatory requirements for licensing and insurance you know, for contractors. The contractors will have to meet the state minimums. We don't expect you to know these things off the top of your head or look them up for us. Our renovation concierge service is going to take care of all of that for you. So the only thing you're going to need to do is gather the contractor's information, fill out the contractor profile, give us their licensing and insurance information, and our RCD, our renovation concierge desk, is going to then you know, make the inquiries to find out whether or not the contractor meets the state required minimums for that particular state. And the process really is that simple. We don't really worry about keeping some kind of a master or approved list for you to work off of. We vet the contractor every single time that we come across them simply because we feel it's up to us to protect the contractor so we're not going to rest on our laurels and say that six months ago they were fine. We want to make sure that they haven't done anything shady or you know, anything that will give us any reason to think that there is any you know, elevated risk in trusting them with the borrower's money. Now, for any of you that are working on situations where we do not have a consultant's report, the bid is going to be hugely important because that's the only document that we have that describes all the work and it's going to be the contractual basis of our relationship with said contractor. So we definitely have some minimum standards in terms of what we will accept in a bid. And this is very important for those of you that you know, are going to work with loans where there are you know, uh, no consultants. So let's talk about what we need to see in a bid in order for us to accept it here at Real Estate Mortgage Network. The first thing to talk about is the bid must be on some kind of letterhead. We have to be able to identify the contracting agency as a legal business entity, first and foremost. So we need to see letterhead that gives us all of the pertinent contact information, which must include the full business name, business address, and phone number. There is no exception. We must have those things on the business letterhead. Some additional items, considering that we are in 2015 after all, that we should see as well. A name of the person that is responsible for the creation of the bid, a URL, and or an email address to make communicating with the contractor as efficient as possible. Inside of the actual identifying information in the bid, there are also some things that we need to see there. First thing that we need to see, the actual project address. It must be the same as our subject property address listed on our mortgage. The customers or client listed on the bid also must be equal to the borrowers listed on our mortgage application. We need to see an estimated start and completion date on the bid. We have to understand whether or not the contractor has the ability to finish the job within the time frame that we can allow them permitted by Fannie Mae. You know, so if there's any indication that that's not the case, we need to know that up front so that we can automatically disqualify the contractor from doing the actual job. Next, the bid itself must be dated. All right, from the time frame that you're working on originating a loan and getting it submitted to us, there's a good likelihood that you're going to go through some bid revisions. We want to make sure that your borrower is certainly on the same page with your contractor and that everybody's under agreement what the you know what the most recent what the most recent bid was, you know that we're working off of. So that's going to help us keep down the level of confusion. Inside of the actual body of the bid, there's some definite information that we need. All right, each and every single line item has to be clear and concise in terms of outlining the materials needed and the installation methods required to install said materials. 
at the end of each line item, we need to see it broken down, an individual labor and material cost. This becomes absolutely you know, uh, you know, important anytime you know, uh, any kind of payment issues arise. So it's important that we have this information so that we can make sure that everybody's on the same page. Aside from having everything totaled out to having all of the proper descriptions and then the breakdown between cost of labor and materials, we need it all to be subtotaled up to a nice lump sum that mathematically actually does make sense. And outside of that, the bid must be executed by not only the contractor, but the contractor and the borrowers. We want to make sure that it is very much implicit, the agreement between contractor and borrower, that everybody's on the same page regarding the materials being used and the methodology for their installation. And this is just another one of those ways that we're trying to encapsulate the borrower into some kind of value so that they can understand where their money is going. We want them to feel very confident in the contractor and the work so that they know that they're going to get a great result. Now, outside of the contractor, the next piece to speak about really is the HUD consultant. And I know a lot of people tend to think that the consultant makes everything more difficult and they try to avoid their use whenever possible. What I want to tell you, quite frankly, that is crazy talk. You would want to use a consultant as often as you possibly could because the consultant is the one third party that's going to be involved that's really going to help keep everyone honest and make sure that this transaction goes through as smoothly as humanly possible. So let's take a second to talk about what this consultant does. Now, after the borrower has already you know, looked at the property, knows what they want to do, and has you know, gotten with the contractor to really talk about making our renovation plan. Once you have that bid in hand, you want to call your consultant and get them out there to take a walk of the property with the bid so that they can absolutely make sure of two things. First, we want to make sure that the contractor has listed all required prerequisite work for making the renovations that they plan to make to the property. You know, sometimes, you know, oversights can happen. Two sets of eyes are always better than one. We want to make sure that all work that needs to be done to get the final result that the borrower is looking for, that they're all represented inside of the transact, you know, inside of the actual, you know, uh, overall write-up. The next thing they're going to look for, any health or safety violations that may exist inside of the property. They want to make sure that these things are not all kind of dumped on the borrower at the last minute or at the end of the transaction. We want to make sure that the borrower is aware of them right up front so that we don't have a disillusioned borrower on our hand. After making that initial consultation, the, the consultant is going to give us back what we call a specification and repairs report, which kind of encapsulates all of that information into one report you know, that we can follow. The great thing is once we have this SOR, the contractor then only needs to uh, basically review the SOR, sign off that he agrees with the opinion of the consultant, and then he won't have to make any further revisions to the bid. We're going to be able to work off of that. So this is a, you know, you know, something that really helps make everything simple. Outside of that entire process with coming up with the SOR, the consultant is also going to come back and make inspections of the work as it is in progress. In fact, prior to every draw that the contractor receives, there's going to be a visit you know, by the consultant who will then give us a report that shows us the overall level of completion which will then allow us to initiate a draw. All right. This is another area that the borrower feels a little bit of value because they're going to have now this third-party advocate that's going to be there to determine whether or not quality grout work is being done in their bathroom. That's not a subjective argument that I think any of us want to be a part of in terms of working as being the lender. So having this third-party advocate there is going to you know protect the borrower you know from a contractor that may be trying to cut corners or you know or you know gets a little lazy here and there, but also in terms of the contractor, it's going to protect the contractor from a borrower that wants to constantly swap out you know um, you know for more expensive you know install techniques you know or materials at the last second. It's going to really help keep everybody on. So it's protection for all parties, and that really helps to keep things you know as smooth as possible. Now, outside of that entire setup and arrangement with the SOR and its follow-up, whenever you have a non-consultant loan, you can still have the consultant come out and take a look to make sure there are no health or safety issues in the property. For the consultant to come out, 
and do that particular service. That's called the preliminary feasibility analysis. This report can actually happen at a reduced cost, somewhere between $250 and $350 is the standard cost of a feasibility study. And you can use these to be able to either A, just demonstrate to the borrower what health and safety you know, um, items need to be addressed within the home, but also if you have a homeowner that is a little bit reluctant to give the borrower a concession in price, you can certainly use this to show the total cost to cure on those items to help the borrower you know, get some kind of benefit or reduction in sales price to work with those. But back onto the track of the SOR. The actual cost of an SOR is going to be based on the amount of the write-up you know, provided by the consultant. Now, there is a chart here on the bottom of this particular slide. It shows the corresponding you know, charge that you can expect to see you know, based on the actual amount of the write-up. You can see at the very bottom end of the spectrum, a $5,000 job you would have a write-up that's approximately $400. Meanwhile, if you go all the way up to $100,000 or more work being done, that would you know, have an expected charge of about $1,000. What I can tell you, A, consultants or third-party providers, I can't tell you specifically this is exactly what they will charge. But this is a great guide to uh, give you what you can expect to see. Also, these fees, you know, the, the consultant charges, they are to be accounted for on your GFE. You know, and included in all your APR calculations, so make sure that you are accounting for this. In terms of speaking about you know uh, handling your GFA, I want you all to realize that we do give you direction in terms of you know taking care of your GFA. We have what we call our renovation worksheet, which is inside of our broker portal. It'll actually help you match up the various fees charged by the third third party service providers inside of the loan and show you exactly where to document them on the GFA so that this way you know you don't have you know any compliance issues with us. Now let us talk about the repair escrow and what we can include inside of it. Inside of that repair escrow we can obviously fit our entire you know uh, repair estimate from the contractor. That's thing number one. The required contingency reserve is always required in, in, at an absolute minimum it would be set at 10%. It can go as high as 20% depending upon risk characteristics discovered either by the underwriter here or the you know or the consultant. Any consultant inspection fees, you know that you know are required, absolutely can be accounted for inside of our repair escrow. Also, up to six months of mortgage payments if the consultant says the property will be uninhabitable during the course of the renovation itself. At the end of each project, we do a title update to make sure that our contractors have not listed any mechanic liens against the property. The cost of that is also included, as well as any fees resulting from you know, a consultation from an either architect or an engineer. Those things can be accounted for in our repair escrow as well. And last but not least, we can also separately account for the cost of permits. I know there are several areas in the country where the cost of permits is a little bit exorbitant and is actually required to be paid up front before any work can actually begin. So in those particular cases, we can account for it separately outside of the bid just to make sure that that money can be pulled at the closing table. We make the fee discussion as easy as possible here at Roman Wholesale. So when you go to our webpage, you're quickly and easily able to find all of our home style forms listed in our conventional form section. This is going to actually include an Excel version of the maximum mortgage worksheet, which is another thing that we should definitely discuss here. Now the MMW that you use for Fannie Mae is a little bit different than ours. Ours is actually done in Excel and it calculates the loan amount for you. So this is going to really help you, uh, you know, uh, kind of ease away from how intimidating these loans could possibly feel. However, this form is very easy. The only thing you have to bring to it, all your supporting documentation. So you get your bid, your SOR, and your appraisal together, and you're going to be able to quickly and easily fill out you know, the actual sections you know, um, for sections A, B, and C. And then section D will do all the work for you and automatically show you your actual maximum mortgage amount. So that this way, you, the only thing you really need to worry about is taking those values and plugging them back into your LOS. Section E is also very easy. It's going to help you determine 
what the borrower's upfront you know, uh, contribution at the closing table you know, should be. So it's going to be a, a good tool for you to use to come up with an early estimation of that particular amount of money. In terms of putting your file together, the best advice that I can possibly give you all is just to say, to begin at the beginning, this is a credit package like every other. So you're literally going to be putting together you're literally going to be putting together your credit package as you would for any other Fannie Mae conventional fixed mortgage. And since that is absolutely the case, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, trying to figure out some other, you know, crazy scenario or things to worry about in order to get the loan started. Start it off as you would any other Fannie Mae mortgage. The only additional piece you have to worry about are there renovation related pieces? Get all of your renovation documentation together early and get it into us as quickly as you can, preferably with the submission of the loan. If you've already done your MMW and worked out your loan amount, you've done the hardest part. Getting the contractor to sign the contractor docs is relatively easy. They like finding those, you know, those particular documentations because it allows them to get paid. The only thing you have to do is explain that and uh, they will be very happy to do it. But get that documentation into us as early as you possibly can so that we can initiate the review by the renovation desk quickly. If you're able to do this, you're going to give us the opportunity to get back to you with the conditions resulting from the renovation review as quickly as possible. So this way you're not blindsided by these additional conditions just a matter of days before you were planning on closing the loan. That's what's going to make things you know, as easy for you and us as humanly possible. You know, and the bottom two steps you see down here in regards to the appraisal, make sure that your borrower is aware you know, of low valuation issues. If you have that, address them quickly. You know, uh, in the home style, typically low valuations, you know, it could definitely play a part in what we're looking at, to, you know, what we're looking at in terms of our total renovation budget. Make sure that your borrower becomes aware of the maximum capabilities of what the work is going to give them. And then you can work on you know, focusing on high ROI or return on investment items and see if there's anything else that maybe was a little superfluous or was an over-improvement for the market that we can cut out to keep the overall renovation cost down. But last but not least, what I want to tell you is do not try to cut corners. Anything, that, any area that we try to skip over is only going to come back you know, with a vengeance in the end in these loans. And I think that that's probably where the majority of the bad reputation comes from. Literally, people just trying to find a way to get over or get around instead of just making their way through. Work your way through it. We're going to make it easy for you. And as long as you're able to do that, we're going to be you know, pretty successful at helping you. And once you, you know, stick to that particular regimen, you're going to come to see that this is really the same process that you've always worked with with every other mortgage that you've done. And for us, no different. You're going to upload your Fannie Mae 3.2 into our broker portal as you always, as you always would. You're going to run to you from there. You're going to upload all of your mortgage docs you know, in the blitz. You're going to get back your loan approval. And then you're going to go into clearing the conditions. It really is you know, that simple. This is not the reinvention you know, of the wheel. We are talking about working with the same wheel that we have always worked with. The major difference and caveat for us, though, is we have our renovation concierge service. And this service is you know, uh, one of the things that really separates us from the others in our particular industry because it allows us to directly administrate the draw process you know, in the project administration phase once the loan actually closes. This greatly reduces the amount of time required to get checked out the door to contractors. If any of you have heard a negative knock against these programs from contractors, that knock you know, more than likely was that it just took too long to get paid. What I want to tell you is the direct administration on our part allows us to get funds out to the contractor between five and seven working days from the time when the draw request was submitted. That is a major, major difference. But let's also take a second to talk about what actually happens when one of these loans makes it to closing. All right. On a loan with a consultant, when the loan goes to closing, the first thing I want you to, re to realize is there's no initial draw given to the contractor on a home style loan we do you know um, in either situation but when we have a consultant they're not given you know any you know any kind of retainer or seed money up front in the process 
they're only going to be paid for work as it is completed. So what absolutely winds up happening, we pay out all of the mortgage level costs and fees as we normally would on the day of close. The remaining money is all put into escrow to pay for the renovations. Right? Once the work is underway, the contractor can then make a request of the, of the consultant to come out to use one of the available draws. On any renovation mortgage, we have a maximum possibility of five draws for the contractor to use. However, the specific number of draws to use will be determined by the consultant on that SOR report. So he's going to have to pick from one of those. You know, he's going to have, he's going to, have to uh, work within the, you know, the frame of draws that he's been allowed by the consultant. Now, once we get to that point, the consultant is going to come out, take stock of the work that's actually been done, give us a completion percentage on, based on each line item from the report, and he's also going to be able to pay them for materials that they actually have on site. All right? Each of the individual draws will be set up to be commiserate with that level of completion and total amount for repairs on site. However, 10% of that amount will be held back. All right, so we're going to have a holdback amount that we're holding back. The contractor will only receive the full balance of all of the holdbacks after the final draw. All right, so that is when they'll be able to receive that particular money. We do this really to make sure that we can, you know, curtail you know, this phenomenon with contractors where once they've received the majority of the money, they kind of take a long time to finish the rest of the work. We don't want that to happen. So by creating this holdback, we give them a reason to continue to push through and finish the job just as quick as they were when they started the job in the first place. Now, the great thing about our setup, the borrowers are literally talking to the same people that you know, we're evaluating the renovation plan and vetting the contractor from the very beginning because these are the same people that worked with our underwriters to help, you know, to help them come up with the renovation conditions. So they're going to remain involved the entire time. So the same great service that we've been able to provide to you as the originator will be extended to your borrower once they are dealing with the actual renovation aspect. And that means that your borrower, the consultant, and the contractor, they all have direct access to the people that are actually processing all of, you know, the documentation you know, for the admin of the project itself. So it's really going to eliminate the ability to have things kind of get uh, muddled between having, you know, just, you know, too many people involved or too many hands in the pot. It makes everything work really great. Now, on the other side of the coin, when we have a loan without a consultant, there is only one draw. And this is after having a satisfactory inspection showing that the work is completed, you know, by the original appraiser. All right, so again, that is a major difference between you know um, what we could, what we would call a streamlined 203k or a home style without a consultant. On a home style without a consultant, there's only that one draw, and that's after a final inspection. So now let us take a moment to encapsulate the difference between the two. You know, our home style with and without a consultant. On a home style loan with a consultant, this is where we can literally do anything and everything that is an eligible repair. The home style never has an actual minimum amount to uh, require to be escrowed you know, in any particular case. However, it does have a hard line maximum, ma you know, maximum amount that can be budgeted for renovations. This maximum you know, amount is going to be 50% of the after improvement value listed on the appraisal. In any home style loan with a consultant, absolutely a, a HUD consultant is required. This HUD consultant gives us the ability to actually escrow six months of actual mortgage payments on the new loan you know, into our renovation budget. The maximum number of draws that we can have on any home style loan with a consultant is set at five. There is no initial draw to the contractor at closing. We're only going to pay for work as it is completed on the project itself, and the contractor will have six months from the date of funding to complete our work. However, we do expect them to start work within 30 days of closing the loan. On the flip side of the coin, talking about the home style without a consultant, this is for more simple renovation plans. You know, certainly we have that line in the sense that at our total repair escrow that must be less than $15,000, and we're not going to allow for any major or structural repairs to happen on a home style loan without a consultant. So our maximum amount that we can finance before it is required to be a consultant loan is going to be set at $15,000.
and obviously we have no you know actual requirement to make it to make the use of a HUD consultant. However, without a HUD consultant, we also have no ability to escrow mortgage payments. There's only one draw on a home style loan without a consultant, and that is a final draw after having a satisfactory inspection saying that all work has been completed. So there absolutely is not an initial you know, initial draw. There's only one final draw. And the contractor has the same six months to finish all work on a home style loan without a consultant as they do with a loan with the consultant. Not that we want to keep you as our lending partner out of the uh, proceedings, however, what I want you to realize is in order to keep everything you know, uh, as, as simple as possible, we want you to make sure that your borrower, your contractor, and your consultant all have the email address for our renovation concierge service. They can reach the desk to process paperwork, to ask questions, and to resolve any issues that they may have. And we ask that you, you know, allow them to work with them directly so that this way they can speak directly with the people that are going to be making decisions and if you're the, you know, and we're talking about the borrower dealing with them, the people that are responsible for protecting their money. Things work out very well for them when they get, when they're able to get in contact with them you know um, directly and work through the problems so that this way nothing ever gets lost in translation. For any of you on the line today that may not be approved lending partners with us, for all the reasons that I presented today, I'm sure you can say we are you know, the best partner that you can have for doing your renovation loans. And if you are not an approved lending partner, reach out to us. We will certainly give you, you know, all the information that you need to get signed up and to make sure that you will be successful with this process. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for attending, for attending today's session. I know that everyone's time is valuable. So, I appreciate the time that you spent here with me today. Hopefully, I've answered any questions that you have, or you know, may have it with the project. But certainly, if you have any additional questions, I'm a continuing resource. I'm going to be here for you. So please make sure that you forward me any questions that you may have.